and okay good so we are we are live so uh, welcome this is the normal Friday section uh, or session uh, on of the executive black belt and executive green belt course so um, I want to take a little bit of time uh, just let's walk through the agenda today um, we, I, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, with some Q&A uh, uh, from lecture five number five or the previous assignments but I think there was a a real key idea in lecture number five um, that um, that we really want to get uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing that let's make sure that we've got it uh, if you haven't yet seen the lecture the lecture five uh, please make sure you watch it um, it is posted online uh, second thing I want to do is I want to review assignment uh, assignment number three and um, and because this does involve something that's a little bit different um, this week, I want to walk through it, and um, and also because there's a significant portion that is required for black belts but not required for green belts, um, this is a pretty important assignment. So we'll want to make sure that we really do it and do it well. Okay, and then we'll cover uh, baselining uh, from the VOC and VOP perspectives. Okay, and this is like uh, I believe it slides uh, around slide 78 or 77, something like that. And then we will cover process capability, the section on process capability. Now, um, for the green belts on the line, um, some of this will be uh, using Minitab, and you may not have Minitab. That's okay, not required for that, but um, to, to, to walk through that. But I do want to show you sort of the basis of how the calculations are going to work. Whether you do them or not um, is, is a different story. But if you're working with your black belts, you should be um, at least uh, uh, able to converse with them in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way uh, and ask, I think, very pointed questions about what it all means. What I can tell you is that process capability is one of those things that people like me, that is statisticians, um, took, and, uh, took something that was actually pretty simple and made it ridiculously complex. So um, my job, I feel, is we're going to have to show some tools. And the tools are not that, they're, quite frankly, they're a little bit unwieldy. Nowhere near as unwieldy as when I was uh, uh, in, the, in the old days. Um, when I was learning this in graduate school, thankfully, there's software around. So I don't have to look up on statistical tables either. So it's all good news. Uh, the good news is the software has gotten a lot better and that we can do a lot of this from a picture, which I find super helpful. Um, and the second thing uh, is just to note that it, it can get a little involved. So I'll give you some advice on sort of like what is the base, what are the basic thinking that you need to to have before you go into there, so you don't lose your lose the forest for the trees. Okay. So let's start out with uh, with Q and A on uh, on uh, lecture five. So first of all, is there anything? You had a chance to see it, or if you attended uh, on Tuesday, I think most people attended. Um, what questions do you have from uh, lecture five? If you recall, we covered basically we covered the whole how to analyze, and that was my view on how you approach data analysis, and it gave you an overview basically of the whole data analysis part of the course. Okay. If there are no specific at this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, if there are no questions, uh, I would like to cover just basically the thoughts, and we'll give uh, just a short example on this. So um, for those of you who know me from uh, consulting, I love to do something, or, or other, other teaching courses, I love to do something that I often just call draw the box. And uh, I often ask people to just draw the box. And so this model revolves around drawing a box. So the box has some arrows coming out, and we should get used to this. It looks kind of like a, the middle part of the SIPOC. And in fact, you can even label it with a P if you like. And over here, we have things that are outputs. We'll either call those, I like calling them outputs, or, but there are, some, there are plenty of other names for them, right? We can also call them results. We can also call them um, uh, responses. We can also call them KOVs, key, key output variables. Some people even go as far as saying key POVs for key, key process output variables. 
um, in management consulting. They're often called KPIs, key process indicators. I guess the, the, oh, that's not so good. I don't like that I put three of those in a row. Um, so maybe we'll erase one of them. This just irks me a little bit. Uh, get rid of that. Okay, but they may be called the key process indicators. Sorry about that, folks key uh, process indicators or performance indicators, right? All of those basically mean the same thing. And we also call them whys. So um, that's, that's simply an output. Usually on a project, we will try to have, in plain vanilla, DMAIC projects, we'll try to have one or two key process output variables, okay? So all starts from there. And the idea is, after you've collected some data, spend a lot of time thinking about what are results and uh, put the res put arrows and draw what those names are. So it all starts with doing that. Then you do the same thing on the left hand side. Okay, and these are the, I'll call them X1, X2, X3, X4. And these are uh, also called inputs. They're called X's as I just demonstrated right there. Um, uh, they're also called, um, uh, mm, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, independent variables. The reason why we talk about these is because we use these to, they're also called drivers. I, I kind of like that one, or potential drivers anyway. I kind of like that because they're driving the output, right? So, so it all starts from kind of this picture right here. And just again, tactically, what we're trying to do in many processes is, and I'll, I don't know if I've done this before, uh, I, I know Shandy and Sue have seen this one, uh, but you know, if I draw this horse, I want to ask you which side of the horse do you want to work on? Most people want to work on this side of the horse, a lot more present, pleasant than this side of the horse, the back end. And so in a lot of our processes to seek improvement, we're going to stop trying to manage the back of it which is a stinky job, and try and increasingly trying to manage by understanding what are the key drivers of this process, and let's manage those. These inputs can be data, they can be different attributes of your customers or of your product, and they can be behaviors. They can be behaviors that people carry out, uh, either on your team or in the work uh, place that people leave behind. There are also things like artifacts, like SOPs, standard operating procedures, or process maps, or job aids that people use, including software. Okay, so it all starts from this. So now I'm going to get a little bit more abstract. And suppose now that you're confronted with an Excel spreadsheet. Let's keep it Excel because I think a number of us know know this. And here are your, uh, and here's my process box. I'm going to put a Y there and a bunch of X's. Okay, here's my X1, X2, X3, X4. And think about a spreadsheet where you've got a Y, my X1, my X2, my X3, my X4. All of those variables kind of lined up in that spreadsheet. So if you want an example, maybe what we're doing is we are um, we're measuring, let's let Y be at a restaurant. Maybe it's the, the turnaround time between when I order and when they, they put the the food on my table, and the drivers are things like the the waiter, which waiter was it, which manager was it, which day of the week, um, what was the price of the food, etc. Okay, all right. So we'll go with that example. I think we've all been at a restaurant, both uh, pleasantly surprised and 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 uh, having unpleasant experience with how long it took. Okay, so that's the spreadsheet. And this is our model that we're thinking about. All right. Now, what we're going to do is functionally then, um, the next thing that we do is we label each one of these things as numerical or categorical. Remember, again, num numerical variables are things that we treat as numbers. Um, so the time that it takes to deliver my food is a number variable because it can vary, right? It can be 5 or 10 or 15 minutes. And I can do math on that. If you get your food in 10 minutes and I get my food in 15 minutes, the food took five minutes longer to get to my table than it did yours. I know that all seems obvious, but sometimes people forget about those facts when they're labeling these things. 
So that's a number variable. Um, if we go on the other side, let's go to the top. We also have category variables. Waiter happens to be a category. It's either Jack or Jim or Ted or, uh, or Mark or whatever, or Brad. Brad told me he used to be a waiter, so did I. Um, uh, and I think at least one of us also has some, some good experience uh, doing that. Um, um, uh, so that's a category, right? So, um, and there's no inherent order to that. I, even if I coded it into numbers, it wouldn't be numbers variables. Like if I called Mark 1 and Jim 2, I couldn't divide that, I couldn't divide Jim by Mark. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so, and the same with manager. Manager's a cat. And the same with day of the week, right? Even if I label Monday as a one and Tuesday as a two and Wednesday as a three, um, it's still, there's some inherent order in that, but it's not a pure number, okay? And then price, however, is a number variable. So just to give you an idea, and then our analysis then becomes driven by these pairs that we select. We start one at a time, and we start to look at, I want, and you ask you, you, for each one of these pairs. Let's take waiter first. Let's see, let's take waiter first. I'll just put a little star there for the moment. And you draw a second artifact. For each one of these pairs, you draw a second one, and it's the PGA wheel. And this stands for practical. These are just props to help you analyze and to help you stop analyzing. G stands for graphical. Okay. A stands for analytical. Don't abbreviate that one. And then we go back to the top. Okay. So the way that it works is you start at the practical. Seems like a good place to start. And you ask the question, I wonder if waiter is driving turnaround time. Okay, that's a good general question, and that, that's all you do in the practical. You just ask that question. Make sure you have that well-formulated question. Then you move to step two, and you say, okay, what, um, what graph can I make? And the reason why, why we've gone through all the trouble of labeling, labeling, labeling these, N and C, is that the choices of graphs and the choices of analysis that you do are driven by the number of variables and the types of variables that you have. So we'll note that this is one num, one cat. Okay? We'll just note that. Um, uh, if we see anything in the plot, then we back, then we go to analytical, which is back it up. This is a plot or a graph. Then we back it up with a calculation. And I like to say, can we believe what we see? You know, a lot of times when we make a picture or we see a table of data, we'll see, uh, yeah, maybe one manager, the performance is a little bit higher than the other manager. But the real question that we want to know is, if we took another sample of, say, the same size, are we confident that we get the same results? That we can generalize this to the general population or to... To, to the larger uh, population so that we can actually do something for business improvement. And that's the real trick to doing statistical analysis. It's not doing the calculations. It's stopping and really saying, okay, is this, when I was growing up, the, the, the question was, is it real or is it Memorex, right? So is it real or is it just a figment of our imagination through the sample? Now, there's actually a video uh, this week that's uh, required in the assignment uh, that's going to require you to actually walk through that. Um, but we're going to do a, a very quick example uh, using Excel stats to show you how to do this. And, um, and Now, we're not quite done yet when we see that we've backed it up with a calculation. We actually have to go back to the practical and say, what can we do about it? What actions can we take? What actions can we take? Uh, can we make improvements? Do we need to get more data? Do we need to forget about this variable? All those are really important uh, actions to consider. So tactically, what you're doing, or functionally what you're doing, as you go through each of these pairs, you're analyzing, is waiter a driver? And let's just go through an, an example. Perhaps it's not. You'd, 
effectively functionally cancel that out and then move on to the next variable. Is manager a driver? Oh, we found that it is not. Doesn't ma the, the turnaround time isn't dependent on a manager. Is turnaround time dependent on day of the week? Oh, we found that it is. Is, is turnaround time dependent on price? No, that it's not. Here we're separating out potential drivers from key drivers and this makes our thinking much more clear. If we find that day of the week is really driving the turnaround time, this gives us a very good reason and that it's statistically uh, uh, significant. This gives us a very good reason to drill down or to find solutions based on uh, day of the week. Okay? Hopefully that should make some sense and it shows you, I think, how you can organize your analysis so that you don't get caught in the weeds you're always coming back up to air and coming back to the practical and you're also making a picture so you can communicate it to others but you're doing your due diligence and making sure that it's real okay let's do a very quick example uh, of that um, and um, let's see to do that I'm gonna have to get back uh, go off of my blackboard here and I want to open up how about examples no, that's not it. Data files used. Okay. Those are all high level. Sorry about this, folks. Get in just a second. Discharge times. Okay, this is a good one. All right, so uh, in this case, we've got uh, time... <laughs> I, it, this was unintentional. It actually lines up pretty well with uh, with Tracy's uh, project, which is happy coincidence here. All right. So um, um, in this case, we've got uh, a number of different hospitals, and um, we've got discharge times. Now, this is a simplified example, but here we're looking at the uh, discharge time, and who knows what this is? Maybe it's the time between. Um, maybe it's the time between. Um, when the when your treatment uh, is when you're ready to discharge and you actually get discharged in hours let's hope not because there's some 18 19 hours but in any case this is a number variable right you can see that by looking at it okay and one of the drivers there's clearly many but one of the drivers is hospital which hospital uh, uh, which hospital did we get the data did we collect the data from so it's natural to see does, do discharge times vary by hospital? So let's draw our box or draw our PGA. We've drawn our box already, and we've got one num, one cat is what we're interested in, right? One num, one cat. That's the sort of analysis that we'll do right here. So we've got P, G, A. Let's start out with our uh, English language question, which is, I wonder if, Remember when you were a kid and you wondered about everything? You had this sense of wonderment? <laughs> Let's try and use that language because I think that's pretty cool. All right, I wonder if hospital it, uh, drives discharge time or discharge results, I'll just put. Right? That's, a, that's sort of a, a wonder. I, I don't know that it's true, but I'm, I'm going to check it out. That's what I'm doing. Okay, now we're going to go into statistics land with the data, and let's do a graph. Okay, now the nice thing about it is that, uh, or the nice thing about this is that Excel statistics does the does some of this stuff for you. Minitab's a, a great tool, by the way, and and we'll cover Minitab a little bit um, later today uh, with some of this. But one thing I love about Excel stats is it's already organized. The analysis is already sort of organized for you. The work you need to do is in collection of the data and asking intelligent questions. So use the props of the box and the PGA wheel to help you ask uh, intelligent data questions. Okay, back to the egg. Um, so now we're going to go into Excel stats and we're going to do our graphics. Remember in this case we have one num, one cat. Now I have to be a little bit careful here. Make sure the N lines up with the numerical one. It actually does. I'm just going to show you what happens if it doesn't. Right? Excel, Excel stats is smart, but it's not that smart. It can't figure out what you put in what columns. So uh, you might have to, if you get something that looks like this with a lot of errors, you might have to switch the variables around. 
you'll have lots of practice with Excel stats and with um, and potentially with Minitab in the next assignment or in the assignment that I just gave you. Okay, so here it is right here, and you can see that there's some. It gives you some summary statistics. It looks like there's two different hospitals, Hospital 1 and Hospital 3. I don't know what happened to Hospital 2, but they're not there anymore. Uh, it looks like we've got uh, 105 uh, measurements, 54 in Hospital 1, 51 in Hospital 3. And here's some overall comparisons. We're going to be very interested in the Summaries tab. And there's a number of different uh, pictures. We went over some of these uh, the other day, but the, my favorite, I think, is the, at least to start out, is the separate frequency charts. Okay, so this helps us understand, if we look at this, we might ask the question, um, do we see anything? Does it seem like, I'm going to make a few more boxes here. Uh, let's, let's pump up the boxes just a little bit more. Does it seem like um, these plots look different for hospital one and one, number three? So I'll let you take a look at this for just a moment and see if we come up with anything, any hypotheses, any thoughts. Take 15 seconds to kind of look at this and see what you think. And just alter this just slightly as we're talking. Just give us a little bit of room on the edges. Okay, uh, let me just take your thoughts on this. Um, does anybody have any comments? There's, by the way, there's no wrong answers. Remember, I'm trying to encourage everybody to talk to their plots. <laughs> you can do it with the door closed if you, uh, or do it uh, with a silent voice inside, inside your head. But the more you can facilitate talking to what you see, the better uh, it is. Okay, are there any thoughts on what you see here? Any hypotheses that you draw? Mark, uh, the first thing that I notice is that sort of the highest pillar um, mm -hmm. for Hospital 1 is around the 8 to 12. Yeah. The highest pillar for Hospital 3 is around 20 to 24. Yeah. So that stands out. Yep, yeah, that definitely stands out. And one of the thing, one of the things that you will be able to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hone in on the type of mathematical questions that we're going to ask, but that's going to essentially lead us to wonder, I wonder if, Hospital 3 has a longer discharge time, typically, than hospital number 1. I mean, that's, that's something that really kind of pops out to me right away. And, and I like how you put it, that kind of the peak, uh, the most common value for hospital number 1 seems to be around between 8 to 12 minutes, where here it's about double, right, about 20 to 24. Or maybe this is hours, I don't know, I can't remember. Uh, uh, okay, um, so um, in any event, um, that's, I think that's a great observation. Now, there are other types of plots. We looked at them the other day uh, called box plots, and we will come back to these, and there's two different types of questions that we'll learn to ask about these by, by treating them as unidentified flying objects. They kind of look like that. If, you, uh, if you're a geek like me, you, you like Star Wars, and it kind of reminds you of the TIE fighters or something like that. So I, I think of them as UFOs. And it look, doesn't look like one of them is kind of taking off and the other one's still left on the ground in the cornfield in Iowa or in New Mexico or wherever UFOs go. Um, um, but uh, if you do that, if you see some of that hovering action, we're going to ask a question. I wonder if the, mean of, if the mean discharge time of three is greater than that of one. So don't worry about asking uh, about finding that or not finding that right now, but we've made that graph. Okay, that's the important thing. We've done the graph. We can look at it. We can learn to start talking about it, and that's the first step. Okay, so let's say that we that that we did want to test that. We decided that yes, the means are different, or they certainly look different. Let's go back to here and let's uh, let's look at our thing. So it certainly looks like. Whoops, I've got my pen upside down. It looks like. The means are different. In fact, we could go greater than we could. We could go into more detail. It looks like hospital number three is greater than hospital number two. But let, let's just say they're different right now. I think that's going to uh, be an easier question to answer. So let's answer that one. And let's see if they're statistically different. So let's go to analyze. 
again, Excel stats love how we can do this because we can just go back to our one num analysis. And we can just go down to our, we're going to learn how to look at a few of these things and it's all in the notes. But the first step is just to look at the confidence intervals and there you go. So you know how one of those questions, one of those nagging questions that always comes back to you when you say, yeah, they're different is by people like me is, did you collect enough data? Can you really say that for sure that they're really different in a substantial way? And we can actually tell that they are by looking at this right here, their confidence intervals, which again is an estimate of the value plus or minus, much like a poll. So when somebody goes out and estimates, you know, what's the percentage of people that are going to vote um, Republican in the next election? in a certain state or Democrat in the next election in a certain state. It might be you know, 45 plus or minus 3, plus or minus a margin of error. That's You can think of it a confidence interval as that plus or minus a margin of error. Okay, So we estimate the average for number 1, plus or minus a margin of error. We estimate the confidence interval for number 2, plus or minus a margin of error. If they don't overlap, we say that they're statistically different. You see how the top of this does not overlap the bottom of this? We could, if we wanted to, we could draw a line and demonstrate that. That shows that they're statistically significant. For me, I love this because you know I learned the calculation method and the p-value and all this kind of stuff, which is fun. But uh, a nice picture is one that that really helps. Okay, we can demonstrate that. So so uh, we 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 can also demonstrate that by looking at uh, something called the p-value, and we're going to learn the that the magic nut. This is this right here. I know this is maybe a, maybe some, we've got some numbers, so if you're number phobic, um, that might be a it might be an issue. But this is actually what's called a hypothesis test, as you can see right there. We're going to learn how to interpret this notation, uh, but we're not going to learn that much. We're not going to spend that much time on it. The key thing is to uh, is to look at this and um, and to learn the phrase if p is low, h o must go. <laughs> Notice that if they're the same, this is our hypothesis that they're the same, uh, uh, we're saying that, yes, this is a low value, right? 0 0.000494 is a pretty small number. Um, so we will say that they're not the same. Okay, And that's, that's essentially proving statistical uh, significance, is looking at this p-value. And if p is low, they're statistically significant. The magic number here is 0 0.05. So we'll compare that to a 0 0.05. If you're a confidence interval person like me, you'll want to look at this, and you'll want to look and see if it overlaps 0, which it does not. So just to give you an idea, uh, I know there's going to be a lot of other stuff that now comes onto the page. Um, this confidence interval, if we draw a line and we say this is 0, notice that the confidence interval starts at minus 16 and it drops at minus 4. So it goes from minus 16 to minus 4. It does not overlap 0. If it overlapped 0, we could say that, well, our estimate for the difference between these two includes 0, so maybe they're not different after all. OK, that's all a review. Um, but we're going to be covering this again and again, because I, I do know that it's not simple. Um, it's not simple to get it. The, the, it, it to me, the reason why I love the, the picture is I can look at this picture and say, are they overlapping or are they not, and move on and say, that's statistically <coughs> significant. OK, so let's go back to here. And let's finish up our, our statement. OK, and uh, we can say, uh, um, so the answer is here, it's yes. It's, it's what we see is real. They really are different. That means we have to do something about it. Well, uh, let's go back to here. What are the ideas that we can have? Well, chances are we're not going to say, uh, uh, well, Hospital th uh, 3, just do what Hospital 1 is doing. There could be lots of other reasons why they're different. But now we're going to drill into this, and we're probably going to maybe collect additional data or do an additional study. But the point is that we're doing so with good reason. They really are statistically different. We're not just wasting our time. We're always going to find some differences between hospitals or between people or between managers. But the question is, do they have any significant effect on the output? Here we've proven that they do. 
So it makes sense for us to move there. Okay? Hopefully that was a illuminating example. And it seems like it's pretty daunting because there's lots of stuff that you have to do. Um, and, and, and that's true. Um, but I do want to show you, uh, let me do one more example. I'm not going to show it in its gory detail. I'll move kind of the way that I would move uh, on this one. Um, so I'm going to shut this, shut this down. I shouldn't have shut down Excel stats, but I should have shut down everything else. And I'm going to move, uh, I'm going to look at um, GMB wait times, tax abatement, emails, gas mileage, gas mileage. How about that? Because we're going to cover that later today. Okay, so here is a study of gas mileage versus gender. And um, in this particular study, there was a, let me get rid of this now, yes. In this particular study, we looked at, um, by the way, this is uh, fictitious data, but in this particular study, which was similar, they looked at a single car on a track, and they had p uh, both, they had a lot of people uh, go on the track, and they measured their gas consumption at a fixed mileage. So we've got over here is gas mileage. And one of the variables, they looked at many variables, but one of the variables that they looked at was gender. Okay, so this is a number, and this is certainly a cat, right? Male or female? Cat or a kitty? I guess it's a cat. Okay, so again, we draw a PGA wheel, and I, I actually advise doing this for the first few times. I draw tons of boxes on my uh, on my sticky notes all over the place. This is how I operate. I don't always draw the PGA wheel, but I do find it's a good crutch to remind myself that I have to come back to the practical. So I wonder if gender is driving gas mileage. Let me make a graph. Let me make a calculation, and then let me get back to there and figure out what's going on. So I can show you how quickly it can go once you've done this. I know I have a num and a cat, right? One num, one cat. Bam, let's take a look at it. Okay, I want to look at uh, a good plot, a plot that makes some sense. Huh, it looks like there may be some difference in the means, but I like looking at a plot. Let's look at separate frequency charts. Oh, my. It certainly looks to me like women get more gas mileage than men on this fixed course. It looks like this has shifted over. Let me take a look at another plot because I'm a believer in plot the data, plot the data, plot the data. Uh, hmm. Now when I'm looked at the frequency, another thing that I notice here is that there were more men in the study than women. So maybe sample size is an issue. Maybe I'm just seeing a small sample. Okay. Well, uh, I'm satisfied. I've done, I've done a look at my uh, plots. I could also look at a box plot if I wanted to. Now I've done it. Yet yeah, looks like, again, it's telling me the same thing. Women get better gas mileage than men. Maybe because of the size of the box, they're a little bit less consistent than, than men for this particular car on this particular course. But uh, the primary driver here, no pun intended, is, um, is the placement there. Okay, let me go see and go down here and see if it's real. Yes, it's real. That is that is statistically significant. I could click on here and find the p value, but I don't need to. I can see that those don't overlap. Okay, one last thing I'm going to note is that notice this confidence interval is very tight, and this one isn't. That does have to do with the sample size of men. There's more sample size of men in this, so the confidence interval is tighter than it is around around women. That makes sense. Our estimate for the average is a better estimate because we're using a larger number of data points. Okay, so that's it. Pretty quick. Now I can come back to my PGA wheel and finish it up. It looks like uh, women get better, uh, higher gas mileage than men. Yes, it's true. It's statistically significant. Again, this is for this car and this track. So I have to get back to here, and what do I do about it? Now, in certain circumstances, it may be something like, well, maybe there's training, or maybe there's uh, adjustments, or whatever. I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure. It depends on the problem setting, what I'm going to do about it. But now I know that it's real, so it, it makes sense for me to go and, and examine that effect. Okay? All right. So that's it. That's the thinking. 
the more you practice this, the easier it gets, I guarantee you. Um, do it a few times, and it's like riding a bike. You won't forget. And the NumCat system is a beauty. Once you get it down, uh, it, it just it selects the tools. And you can see it's all context-driven, so it's forcing you to, to, to make math real. And we all know that we, <laughs> we've been in the situation where people talk about a math problem, and it sounds like they came from outer space. Uh, we don't want to do that. Okay, so that was a lengthy uh, that was a lengthy review, but uh, hopefully uh, hopefully it was it was helpful. Okay, so I now I want to get back to our uh, regularly scheduled program, uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time before we get into the the lecture today. Obviously, it's going to be a bit of a short lecture, but um, let's talk about assignment number three. Um, um, uh, there we go. Okay, so I'm just going to bring that up. Here's assignment number three, which sent out to you today in the email. Um, this one happens to be for green belt, but you'll see the differences. Um, the only difference between green belt and black belt is that black, green belt has a lot more optional stuff. Um, so just to kind of go through it, there's reading and course material. It's a little more extensive than it was uh, for the previous one. So assignment number three, I should say this, is due on the 7th of May, which is not next Tuesday. It's the Tuesday after next. So you have a little more time, but you're going to need to use it. Um, so again, it's reading through the course slides, uh, making sure that you take the notes and uh, fill out um, your, uh, your uh, journals, your journal entries for the end of it. Um, there's some exercises from the binder. If you're a black belt, I, I need you to work through all of those exercises that are indicated. And there's a, a PowerPoint slide in here that indicates which ones. And also has the data for you. So you just click on it and it's open right there for you. Uh, there's also a few supplementary videos um, that are made. Um, there's one on control charts. Um, there's one on distributions. This is optional for green belts, non-optional for black belts. There's one on process sigma. This is optional for green belts, non-optional for black belts. And there's an introduction to statistical inference. I just want to show you where that is. You can just click on the link here. And there it is. It's just taking you to this. Um, I think there was a couple of people who wondered where the videos were. Here they are. You just have to scroll a little bit. They're down on the. They're they're down as you move down. There's lecture five, uh, and there's the supplements. There's control charts, distributions, process sigma, statistical inference. You just click on these, and you can watch them and expand them, etc. Okay, so that's what that is. Um, if if your company blocks YouTube, you may have to do it at home, because that's where they're posted. Okay, so that's that, and um, then there's some, there's as usual, there's bringing out the best in people, a few chapters in that, additional exercises. There's also a, a graphical, we're going to start our looking at some visual displays and working at uh, displaying quantitative uh, data, kind of understanding what are some of the principles of that so we can make good quantitative displays. Um, that is uh, found, uh, we're going to start doing that. Um, Hopefully this will be kind of fun. You take a little quiz at this place. It'll take you five minutes at most. And uh, you get to pick and read one additional article. And then there's some assigned discussion. Okay, so that's what the assignment is. Um, nothing different about the course three slides. Here's the exercises. You can see that they're all, uh, whoops, they're all, uh, all the data are given right in the binder. So you just double click on that and it will open them up. Okay. So that's what that that's how that works. You can hit the save button and anything you put in there will be saved. Okay? Lengthy, okay? So for black belts you need to get started early and uh, working on it. Um, here are the supplementary lectures. Bring out the best in people, there's some questions that require responses. There's three additional exercises. Um, again, the data are given right here. Um, these are around uh, Pareto charts <laughs> and uh, baselining. Uh, here's a graphical quiz. And then finally, the assigned discussion. Uh, I want to make this clear. You, you are to contact your assigned member. So I've assigned uh, pairs of people. And uh, you need to open that up, see who you're to contact this, uh, in, for this assignment, and, uh, 
and uh, schedule that and make sure the talk happens. So I want you to talk through um, the quiz and the Perceptual Edge article that you picked and why. Uh, statistical inference, I want you to spend 10 minutes to talk through and bring out the best in, in people, 10 minutes or more. Um, and then respond about who you spoke with and uh, how it was valuable to you and what insights you got. Okay? All right, so that's, that's basically it on the assigned discussion. Uh, one last comment. We're all busy. So make your, make your assignments, not make your assignments, schedule your talks with the other people now. Don't wait until you've done the reading. Okay? Do it now. Um, I can imagine, um, I mean, my calendar is pretty full, but, um, you know, I can imagine some, some of you, uh, your calendars must be bursting. So to do it at the last minute is not going to happen. Um, so do it now. Um, do it I'm, not see, this is Tracy, I'm not seeing the assignments uh, when I open up uh, the EBB and the EGB assignment. Oh, yeah. So here it is, right? Uh, you're not seeing the assignments, Tracy? I'm sorry, I was on two. I was just clicked on the wrong one. I oh, see okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, no, that, that's, that's not a problem. So if you just click on the this icon right here, it should give you the... Uh, the selection. So Shani, you're to talk to John Turton, uh, Patrick and, and Sue are talking, uh, Jim Sendoma and Brad are talking, and Tracy, uh, you and I are having the discussion. So, so those are the those are the uh, assigned pairs. And here's your contact information. Okie doke. All right. Hopefully that was fairly clear, and I've tried to make it as easy as possible. I know this is a long assignment, so um, like I said, get get the started early. <laughs> okay. Uh, what questions do you have on or comments do you have on the assignment? Okay. I'm sorry? I said Sue and I don't have any questions. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Let's um let's get started on the uh, on the formal uh, lecture. I know I took a, a long time, but hopefully the review of the the how to analyze data. I mean that's such a key to the rest of the course that it's it's really important to get it down. And um, um, I think if you try and think that way, it's going to really help. Let's go to baselining, which is on 77 of our slides, uh, slide 77. And I just want to talk pretty quickly through this and give you an idea. We all have our thoughts on baselining, and um, I'd like you to take 30 seconds and think about what is your definition. If somebody says to you, I've baselined this process, or I've gotten the baseline for whatever, um, uh, what is your definition, or how would you define baseline? I'd like to take 30 seconds, and then let's have, uh, I'd like to get your responses on that. Okay, so take 30 seconds to just think about what, your uh, your um, meaning definition of baseline would be. Remember, there's no wrong answers here. Okay, let's kind of go around the, the room, hopefully you've had, or the virtual room, <laughs> if you will. And let's, uh, let's start with, uh, let's start with uh, Sue. So, Sue, what is, what is your definition of baselining? If, if somebody said, uh, I want you to do a baseline for this particular process, for, say, the sales process, what, 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 would, your be, what would be your interpretation of that? Actually, Mark, I'll go first. Sue just okay. ran out really quick to the ladies' room. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, she, she just ran out. That's um, okay. For me, I, I would say that I'm getting the current state. I'm figuring out and getting metrics to say what, what currently is happening with the process and what outputs and the level of the output. Okay, great. And, and, and Tracy, I guess I'll just ask you if you have anything to add to that. I, I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it really captures it, I think. And, and the one thing I wanted to say was that if we're talking, but we're talking about first of all, we're talking about current performance, and I want to put a phrase in there: before you make any changes, okay, before changes are made. 
And that's an important, that's an important thing to, uh, to get in there. Now, we're going to talk about something a little bit more specific because baselining to a lot of folks could also mean, um, can also mean um, um, uh, what uh, people, you know, what's my baseline staffing levels, or it could be uh, what are people currently doing. Um, but we're going to be more specific, and we're going to be we're going to be speaking about it as an output. We're talking about baseline performance of one or more KOVs. Okay, so we're talking about literally one num usually. Um, but what is our K? What is our KOV or our Y, our key output variable? What is the baseline for that particular measurement? Okay, so we're talking about metrics and we're talking about measurements. One last thing I want to talk, talk about is that sometimes people confuse baselining with benchmarking. Uh, benchmarking usually, or some people use the word benchmark for baseline. Um, uh, but we want to be clear that it's not what's the best performance in the industry. It's not what some other company is doing. It's not a goal for where you want to be. It's actually what's happening right now. I think we're all, we're all in that conversation, so I think that, uh, I think that works. Okay, um, so as we go through this, what I want you to get is, is the, the big aha that I want you to get is I want you to get that there's two parts to baselining. Most people think, oh, it's just the average of a process. Um, we should be starting to, to realize that there's, there's a reason why I ask you to make a graph before you do any analysis. It's because a graph is a very rich source of information as opposed to when somebody says, oh, the average turnaround time is this. Averages can be extremely misleading and they're not very customer focused. So we're going to think about it in two different ways. We're going to think about it as making a statement of is the process, number one, is the process stable? And number two is how capable is this process? And we'll define those terms more objectively in just a moment. The key concept is that by looking at stability and capability, we're doing both. We're looking at the VOP, the voice of the process, and the voice of the customer. So on the left-hand side, I've got the voice of the process. On the right-hand side, I've got the voice of the customer. Okay? So, and this is really important. Uh, this view on the left-hand side is one that's really hard. Most companies who do a baseline, um, if they're doing it well, they'll do the voice of the customer, but very few of them take it to the left-hand side and say, let's also do the voice of the process. The reason why we do this is because it's going to help us understand what are the most logical and what are the best actions to take to make things better. Okay? We're going to see things more clearly, and we're going to take better actions in order to do this. So uh, the voice of the process, the tool of choice that we're going to look at is the control chart. Okay, that's it. A control chart tells us, and, and if you missed the lecture, there is a supplementary uh, lecture on uh, week three on control charts that's an introduction to it. And um, suffice it to say, the, short, the long and the short is, this is time, and this is our, in this case, this is our KOV. So we're looking at how our KOV varies over time, but because our brains are really good at picking up patterns, even patterns that do not really exist, <laughs> we put in these red lines to help us understand when a process is stable and when it's unstable. And our operational definition of that is if it's inside the red lines, it is a stable process. It does not mean that it's a good process. It means that it's a stable process. So um, it also gives us guidelines for when we firefight and when we don't. So essentially it's saying that this this point is not a point that's firefightable. We can't go in and distinguish this point from all these other points. Okay. On the other hand, if we had a point that was way up here or way up here, I'm just drawing this in, it doesn't really exist in this plot, that would be sufficient for us to say, hey, you know what, we really do need to look into that specific point and understand why it's out of control. We call that out of control. On the right hand side, uh, this is essentially a histogram with a line in it, <laughs> with a line drawn through it. I'm just telling you what it is. 
And this line is a what we call a specification. It might come from a customer, it might be a management goal, but this or it might come down from Mount Olympus, <laughs> right? Uh, it might say, you know, thou shalt never have a processing time greater than 95 minutes. Okay? Now, what is that set by? It's usually set by a company goal or something like that. And it distinguishes it from these red lines, which are based on data. These lines come from data. Okay? These lines come from the customer or management or something like that. But essentially, we will learn soon that our, our capability is merely a statement of what percentage of time do we not meet that customer expectation Okay, in terms of this. So it's a one-two punch. First of all, is the process stable? And second, is it capable? Are we, are we, do we have a low percentage of defects or do we have a high percentage of times that we meet the customer spec? Simple as that. So that's what we're going to define our baseline as. We make a statement of is the process stable? And we make a statement of what percentage of times do we meet the customer requirements, whether that's our manager, whether it's an executive, or whether it's an outside customer. Um, that's the thinking that we bring to it. Okay? So um, let's just kind of continue on this. And the reason we do this is we're putting it into a more powerful context than we usually do. And I, I just want to talk through this fairly quickly. I'm sure we're all used to seeing management snapshots where we'll have metrics like quality or efficiency uh, or time, on time percent, or appended work is like work in progress. Um, and we've all been in those meetings, myself included, where we look at our actuals and somebody says, well, let, let's, take, let's take this one right here. Suppose I'm a manager of a thing and, some, and, and my boss looks at me and says, Mark, you know, efficiencies, Talk to me about efficiencies. And I say, well, you know, my, I'll show you how the meeting's going to go. Well, yeah, my actuals were at 83%. I know my target was 90%. So I'm down by 7.8%. I know that's bad. But you know what? Let's look at the bright side. Same time last year, I was at 81%. So really, I'm getting better. Now, the problem with that is these red, yellows, and greens are, are, are giving us conflicting information because the context isn't strong enough for us to compare. When we look at data as it evolves over time in a, in a stronger way, which I'll do right here, when we see how it's evolving over time, we can say very clearly, for example, if this were my efficiencies, it's not, it's processing time, but if this were efficiencies over time and this covered a year, my argument about whether it's getting better over the year doesn't make a lot of sense. And to the, the it, it, this is a process that's not showing any improvement or getting worse. It's just staying and hanging where it is, not getting any better, not getting any worse. So it's a more powerful context of talking about the problem than something like this. And that's why we do this. Okay? All right. Let's take a look at, I'm going to skip over 81, but we can obviously look at, the. There, there's four different states uh, of this. If we look at good capability and bad capability and good vo uh, stability and bad stability. Okay, let's look at all those uh, separately. First of all, I could have the worst case scenario where I have an out of control process. I have many points outside of my control limits. You see that? And also I have a very high proportion of bad. This is pended work, so my work in progress. I have spikes that are there and Boy, if I look at it, I have a lot of time. I have just so much work in progress. It's way over where I need to be. Uh, this is a process where the, the recommended action would be to first look into these specific data points, get it to be in control. And if you can, then take a look and see if you improve the process to the point where, um, where uh, we're done or whether you need to run a project on it. Okay? Let's look at this one, which is also fairly straightforward. We have, a lot, we have an out-of-control process, but we're getting lucky. Uh, we have a high proportion of goods. Um, well, that can be good and bad. It's good in the sense that we don't have to fight any fires right away, but we better start looking into why we go out of control once in a while to see if we can stop that. The reason is other hospitals or other health plans or other manufacturing companies or other companies that are not like us uh, can take advantage of that and move in and uh, perhaps provide a higher level of service and talk about it and nudge us in a, in a direction where we need to go anyway. The third state 
which is the state of many, many processes, is when we look at the KOVs, despite the fact that everybody says our process is out of control, they don't really mean that from a measurement perspective. They mean that from a process perspective in the sense that we don't really have a consistent process or whatever. But they're still getting, believe it or not, from the customer's view, consistent results. Um, but at the same time, there's a very high percentage of bad results. So it's consistent from the customer's view, but it's not an acceptable process. This is a case where we can't look at any individual data point to really give us a clue because they're all kind of similar to each other. That's what these red lines are saying. You can't look at any one data point and figure out the problem. You've got to look at all the data in total and try and understand what are the drivers, just like we did with the drawing that process box, understand what are the key drivers, and then do the hard work of figuring which are the key drivers and what are you going to do about them. And to move the needle, to really fundamentally shift this variation, either to tighten it up or to shift it left or to do both of those things. Okay? So we want to actually do uh, what we can to shift this to the left and to tighten it up. But the last situation is kind of what we're trying to get to with all of these. That is an in-control process which has a high proportion of good. And that's where we really get high customer satisfaction and loyalty is when we're not only doing a good job, but we're doing it very consistently and, and, the com and, our, co and our customers can trust us uh, that we're going to do it well. That's where we want to be. Now the point of all this is that um, if you only looked at high percentage good or high percentage bad, there are going to be places where you ignore uh, certain data and you, you maybe do it in a different, uh, you maybe improve your process in a different way. Okay, so let's take a look at um, let's take a look at this. Um, and the steps are simply this: first, look at stability, and second, look at capability. All right, and uh, and just do the noting. Uh, if you find any special cause data points which are called outliers, do something about them. Note any clear trends, um, and so forth. Do that first, because sometimes capability. It might not mean anything. If you have a process that's totally out of control, what does it really mean to say that, well, 80% of the time or 50% of the time that we get it, we get it right? Um, if the process is out of control and unpredictable, maybe <laughs> next week will be just terrible and we'll start to you know, move that 50% to, to 20 or maybe it'll improve. We just don't know. That's a bad place to be in uh, you know, if you have to report to a COO or or anything like that, it's a bad place to be in uh, if you can't predict what your performance is going to be. Second is we're going to do the capability. And that just means percent good, percent bad. Okay? Let's do a quick example using DMV. Not this one. I am going to do this one in Excel stats, but, but uh, you could also do this one in Minitab. Maybe I'll show you in Minitab quickly. But here is the DMV wait times. Let's take a look at that. Here's the time I waited at the DMV. And uh, I'm going to baseline my process. Like I said, first step is to assess the stability of the process, which I'm going to do right now. Uh, we do that by looking at a control chart. So to do that in Excel statistics, you go and open up the control spreadsheet. Happens to be in the numerical tab. And we clear out the data. And we paste in our own data. My, my, something is open and not having fun. Here's my DMV wait times. I'll just copy that. And paste it in right there. Whoops, right there. Again, this is in the lecture uh, that's a supplemental lecture on control charts if you've missed it. It usually goes much faster if, you, if I don't have to do this online stuff. Uh, it doesn't have to refresh so much. But um, uh, there we go. If we look at the, then the eye chart, we can see that largely this is a process that is stable. There's a couple of points that I might want to check into. Maybe this one is borderline. Maybe this one is borderline. I might want to check into it. 
but it's a process that's not going up or down. There's no clear trends here, and there's no clear outliers either. So this seems to be a pretty stable process. So let's do the next part. So the next question is, okay, so it's stable. Does that mean it's good? Absolutely not. We need to make sure that it's capable. So let's do that too. Capability is essentially by drawing in the spec line in the histogram. So the histogram is found in one num. And let's check with our drawing here. It says, for the last 90 days a measurement was taken. Oh, and it says, when we talk to the customers and sponsors, the specification is we don't want customers to wait more than 18 minutes in line. Okay, so let's compare and see how often they wait more than 18 minutes. That tells us the, the capability, or lack thereof, certainly tells us the percent bad. So let's take a look. Oops, here's our one num. Okay, to do that we can go on the Summaries tab. Again, I'm going to open this up. I gave you this advice in the, the other lecture. I like to open up the, oops, uh, to open up the uh, histogram to give myself a little more room on each side so I can see the patterns. Uh, not one. I'll look at 12. And we'll do a histogram. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little trick here. And I'm actually going to make Excel stats. The problem with this is I can do the percentage and I can show the values. So I could count up all these values. I'm just going to make it simple and just do uh, one decimal point. I could count up all these, but the problem is I want my 18 there. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, one way of doing that, and it's a little trick, is to go from a mul uh, is to use a multiple of 18, which 18 times 2 I know is 36, and then just make two boxes. And there it is right there. So here I can tell what percentage is above 18 minutes. And holy moly, it's 72%. Uh, I don't like yellow. That's not yellow. That's red. Hey. That's not yellow. That's red. <laughs> uh, that's bad. So despite the fact that we have a stable process, our local DMV is not meeting the customer expectations 72% of the time. So this is a great opportunity to uh, run a project because it's stable we're going to have to drill into all the different reasons why customers are waiting more than 18 minutes. Is it, is, is it for all the different things that they can do at the DMV? Is it for just uh, licenses is it, and registration? Uh, maybe is it, uh, does it differ during the day and the, the afternoon shift? Is it because uh, uh, we only have one line as opposed to two? We don't know. We need to dig into those. If we found one data point, like every Friday it was bad, huh, we could fix that. That's a simpler problem. But we don't have that. Okay? So that's basically, um, that's basically what we walked through. And now that's given in here uh, in the lecture notes uh, or in the book where we looked at the voice of process. And here I made a much more complicated picture. But now you saw my little trick, right? So you can use that too um, to do the capability. Here we have a very stable process, but a not capable process. You better do something about it. A Lean Six Sigma project is a good thing to do for this one. Mark, can I just yes. ask, could you just very quickly run through those steps again as to how you went from the it's stable to the capable, those two charts? If you could just, just a very, very quick, I don't want you to spend a lot of time on it. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean the terms? Um, well, you, you kind of manipulated a couple of the fields, and you were doing it for a particular reason, and I think I just missed something and didn't make the ah. connection. Okay, so the first thing is, the, the process is, right, you, you look at the control chart first. You have to have to collect the data in time order if you're to do this. And by the way, I'm not a literal person, so if it turns out that you can't collect the data in time order, then you can't do it, right? And we need to figure out a way to do our baseline in a, in a different way. This is perfect case scenario, right? So I just want to mention that because you guys are on a project where you've already done a snapshot of the data, and you get data at a very irregular intervals, maybe three times in the year. So you're not going to have a control chart that looks like this. It's just not going to happen. So that's the reason why I mentioned that. But if you're doing the, the, the discharge times uh, project, or if you're doing a DMV waiting time in line, or you're, you're doing turnaround time at a restaurant, you could do that. You could get samples. You could get two or three a day. No problem whatsoever. Look at that over a month. 
So the first thing that you do is you look at this, the, the control chart, you see is it stable over time? And that's simply a question of looking at is it between the red lines or not? Is it trending up? Is it trending down over time? Um, no clear indication that it is, so, and there's nothing outside of the red, so we, we say it's, it's stable. It's a stable process. The second question then is, is it a capable process? That's a straightforward question that we're going to cover in the next section. And what it means, is, what we do is we just draw, we essentially say, um, uh, what percentage of the time are we above or below the specification? In this case, being above is bad, being below, below is good. So we draw that line and we look at our data and we count how much is below and how much is above. In Excel stats, it's just kind of nice that we can do it pretty easily and quickly by making a histogram, manipulating that histogram, and then, and then counting it. Um, so, so I'm going to go ahead and do that for you because I do think that that's a, it's a little trick. And uh, uh, so I'm going to show you doing, uh, how to do that. Whoops. Uh, it's a trick in one num. So I will, I'll tell you what, let's just redo the one num analysis so we can do it from scratch. Oh, I need to close it. I'll do it again. Okay, there we go. So this is where we started, right? So, so the way that you can do this and get Excel stats to draw this for you, is you go to the summaries tab. And the summaries tab, it has a lot more doodads on the histogram, right? So you can put a percentage instead of a count frequency. So let's do that. I'm going to blow this up so we can see it a little better. Come on. There we go. Okay. We can show the values. So the values are what's between these, these numbers. And I'm going to take out the decimal points just to make it easier to read. Now, I certainly could count all of these values that were less than 18, right? I'm just noting, hey, here's where my spec is. It was 18 minutes, okay? So it's somewhere there. I can count this, and I can get a good approximation, but I want to make it easy on myself. So what I do here is I note that 18 is my spec. So what's a multiple of 18? Well, 2 times 18 is 36, and that exceeds 31, so I'm good. I can make a multiple of 18 there, and I can put 36 there. So if I go from thir from 0 to 36, see how this says 17.8? That's okay, but I'd rather it say 18 so that it's easy for me. So I'm just manipulating it. It's a trick. You don't have to do this, but it's a little trick. There we go. Okay, so now I've got 18 right there. And again, I could count 37 plus 28 plus 3 plus 4 plus 0. I can count that, and that's not too bad, right? 7 plus 7 is 44, plus 28 is 74, uh, minus 2 is uh, 72. So that's 72%. I did it in my head, but I'm lazy. So instead of doing 10 classes, let me just make it 2 with a break at 18. Now I can count easily. I see that's 72. 72 above 18, 28 below 18. Okay? Yes, thank you, Mark. You are very welcome. Um, another very easy way to do this is to simply count. Uh, you know, this is above 18. Yes, it is. This is above 18. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's all we're doing. No, it's not. That, that, that's all we're really doing here. Um, and we're letting the computer do it for us because, um, uh, well, there may be a lot of data. Okay. Um, so that's basically all we wanted to talk about with uh, with uh, with uh, baselining, with the general baselining discussion. And now I want to talk about process capability. But before I do, I want to make sure I address your question. So what questions do you have on baselining what we've covered? OK, key takeaway, don't forget this is baselining consists of two parts, stability and capability. That's the perfect case scenario. There is a homework problem where you're going to be challenged a little bit with that. I'm just giving you a, a heads up. That's black belts. Okay? So, Mark, I, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, with our pharmacy project, we didn't necessarily do a control chart, but we definitely know it's out of control. But 
we had data, say we don't, like in our project, we don't have data that is over time. So really you head right into the capability, is what you're saying? For uh, I'm, I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you need okay. to be flexible, but um, you still want to get some sort of uh, assessment of how stable that process is. You may have to go in and interview people and talk about what has changed over the last couple of years. That's a poor substitute for real data or for, for real metrics, but it's way better than nothing. Okay. okay. I wouldn't we say had that. Stuff, we just didn't have a controlled chart necessarily, but we, we came up with that. Right. And, you know, I mean, part of it is uh, building a, we talk about building a culture. Part of this is I walk into many companies where that's true for almost every project they do is that, well, we don't do a control chart because we don't have data over time. Well, what does that mean? It means that you're not really taking a process view of your operations. Um, and, and I don't mean you personally, but I mean, you know, growing the business means that you, into a, a culture that asks reasonable questions about their processes means starting to be able to collect metrics over time. The reason is because processes don't remain the same over time. They change personnel, they change the way things are done. Managing processes takes a lot of work and, 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 and having some metrics around that um, is, is important and looking at them over time is a fundamentally vital way of doing it, uh, whether you look at a control chart or not. So, uh, you know, I, obviously I'm up on my soapbox now, but, um, um, and, and by the way, just to, just to let you know, you know, I, I try to practice what I preach, but I, I sometimes fail. <laughs> so if you look at my business, there are things that we measure over time and there are things that we have failed to do so. Um, and that's life, <laughs> right? So um, uh, we'll talk a lot more about this when we do the control phase talk um, because a big part of a black belt's work is to institute those practices into the, man into the processes that their projects are doing, right? So you may not have come in with a control chart, but, but it's going to make a huge difference if you can walk out with one and walk out with a process where people understand I need to measure one or two things, not, not 10, not 15, not a, a thousand, but one or two things and track them over time. That's really going to help me measure and manage my process better. Um, all right. One of the things that I try to do, Mark, with the projects that I've worked on is that if I don't have it at the beginning, it's what I provide to the customer at the end, yeah. that they have a way to, to continue to measure their process with a control chart. So, no. like, to get them to that point. But many times when you come in, it's, the data isn't there or it's not at that point. No, no doubt, no doubt, and 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 even to come out with it, it's it's, you know, the way that you characterize. I love that you said that. Um, but uh, you and I know that the way that you characterize it by saying I give them something, <laughs> um, you know, they have to be bought into it as well. Otherwise, that doesn't work. Um, and and I know you know that. I'm just mentioning that. For Absolutely, the yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Well, it does bring us to the next section of process capability. And um, I'm not going to go through all the different slides. Um, and I think the reason why is, um, one is I think it's, it's, it's longer than we need to give on it. And you can go through back through the slides and get it. I want to give you a basic flavor of what you do when. And, uh, and, and uh, let's walk through some examples. We'll make it more like a workshop um, than it is a, uh, a slide lecture. I'm going to try and do that anyway. Um, so um, in order to do that, let's see. I'm going to go to my um, I'm going to go to my whiteboard, and let's just kind of talk through um, sort of the outline of uh, of what we want to. Oh shoot! There we go. Okay, there we go. There's my horse. <laughs> okay, so let's. All right, let's talk about process capability, and. Um, so capability, first and foremost, I want to make sure everybody gets this, is there's lots, the reason why I say this is because people like me have overcomplicated it because we've created structures like um, PPK, CPK, CP, PP, sounds like we got them from, you know, 10-year-olds. Um, 
the sigma process sigma level. Okay, and we did all these things, and really what we're talking about with all of these things is what percent good if you're a glass half full person, or what percent bad is your process? That's all we're really talking about. So capability when it comes to it is really just a question of what percent of the time do you deliver um, within the customer specifications and what percent do you deliver outside of the customer specifications. So whenever we get lost in the techniques, it's, you know, let's, let's, let's not let ourselves do that. Okay, and for this, to answer, so this is the question that we're really trying to answer, what percent good? We have two different cases. The first case is we have a lot of data. And I'll define what that is. When we have a lot of data, we just count. Count it. Okay, we all know how to do this. <laughs> we, and, and I used that histogram, right? All I did was count. Um, okay, so, so most, for many processes, we can get away. We just count. How many are good? How many are bad? That's it. That gives us our capability. Good statement, right? So that should relieve a lot of pressure. If we have a lot of data, yeah, we can just count, and that count is going to be pretty reliable. The second situation, however, is when we don't have a lot of data. And this is really, uh, it's border, it's, green belts should be conversant in this, but it's really black belt territory. And this gets into the online lecture that the black belts, it's not optional for, it's optional for green belts, is the lecture on distributions. Um, but we're going to cover the normal distribution, but we don't have a lot of data. We're going to use two tools. In Excel stats, we're going to use the PDF tool, and in Minitab, we will use the probability plot. Okay? And in this section, and in this section only, we're going to cover what's called a normal distribution only. Cover the other ones in later sections, okay? A normal distribution you will recognize as our friend the bell curve, okay? Now it turns out that even if you have distributions that are not bell curved, um, there's a sneaky way to make them bell curved um, that we'll learn later. But for now, and, and, and so you can breathe a bit of a sigh of relief, uh, but for now, uh, we, we're going to cover normal distributions, okay? All right, so that's it. So when we lose our bearings, I'll just kind of come back to this chalkboard and say, well, wait a second, you know, what we're really trying to do is what percent good or what percent bad. Let's not worry about our notation or anything like this. Um, all right, so that's where we're going to go. And to do that, let's just kind of start by walking through some of this. But um, as I said, I'm not going to be, whoops, I'm not going to be too, uh, too uh, detailed on every single slide. But I am going to be mindful of the time as well. We have about a half hour. So we can do a couple of examples. Um, all right, so first of all, we are talking about baselining the process. We can also talk about this at the end, right, at the before and after snapshot sort of thing. But we're really talking about baselining the process. As we go through the DMAIC process, we've already made the business case. We've already linked to the customer. We already have our SIPOC. Right? We know what our team is. We know what our measurements are. That's our KOV. We've gone out. We've collected some baseline data. We know it's high-quality data. And we've rescoped our project, so that's all set. Now we're going to just make a statement of where we are with, with respect to the metrics that we're using. Okay. Hopefully it all makes sense. I already talked about this. We want to do this the easy way. Why not? It's how often we get it right with respect to the customer. Or if you're a glass half empty person, how often we get it wrong with respect to the customer. I'm only saying that tongue in cheek. Sometimes it's really the right way to look at it is how many defects do we make rather than how, what, how many times do we get it right. You have to be the judge of that. Um, and I talk about this in one of the supplementary lectures on process sigma. People sometimes have a hard time being motivated if you have a process that's 98 or 99% you get it right. There still may be a lot of 
uh, value and getting it better than 99%. Um, and in such cases, maybe you talk about the number of defects that are made yearly. That might help. Uh, a pharmacy situation reminds me of that, right? I mean, if we're going to fill, I work with an online pharmacy, uh, there's no way that they could say it's acceptable to make, you know, one out of every hundred, we're going to give somebody the wrong drug. That's just not acceptable. So if people are thinking 99% is good, we, we need to change that thinking. So maybe it is correct to talk about defects in that case. Okay, enough. Uh, here's what our lower, here's what our, uh, uh, our, our normal distribution looks like. And just to give you an idea, um, when we're talking about capability, sometimes we talk about uh, a two-sided capability, and sometimes we talk about a one-sided capability. Manufacturing problems often have a two-sided capability. So, for example, in a two-sided capability, the bad stuff is out here and here. If I'm making a plastic part that's got to fit in a toaster, ooh, that sounds bad in and of itself, that's got to fit maybe in a, uh, 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 in a car, I'm making a plastic part, or if, um, uh, if I'm making a, 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 let's say I'm making rulers, <laughs> right? I don't want them to be too long, but I also don't want them to be too short, okay? So, so that comes up a lot. Um, in in, um, in uh, service industries, a lot of times we have what's called a one-sided spec, and you can think about this in terms of um, in terms of maybe the discharge project would be a good one. Um, we have an upper limit, uh, and that's kind of the bad stuff is above that. Whatever, maybe it's 12-hour discharge, or maybe we don't want to discharge anybody after 12 p.m. after noon, um, or something like that. Um, um, so we look at the number of discharges after 12 p.m. Uh, we have an upper spec, but we don't have a lower spec. Um, um, so that makes sense. In our restaurant, either one of these might be, might be good. So if I'm looking at turnaround time for food to come to my table, maybe I have a one-sided spec. Maybe it's this one right here, where it's I want it to be delivered within 10 minutes. Uh, and I don't care about if you deliver it within two minutes, that's okay. That might be fine for a sandwich, but what about if you were cooking chicken? <laughs> well, if you're cooking chicken, I want to make sure that it's above, say, three minutes, right? Because I want it to be fresh. Maybe it's three to twelve, or maybe it's three to yeah, three to twelve. I want it to come with uh, no less than three minutes, because then I know it's going to be raw. I might get sick, but I don't want it to come in more than twelve minutes. All right, so so hopefully you, you get that. We're going to focus on, for, for our lecture, primarily this example because I find that most service industries have one-sided specs. And they're, they're, they are easier questions to answer, so, so happy. <laughs> uh, uh, I just make a comment in one of these slides, what happens if you don't have specs? Make them up for now and go and get them. That's the answer. Okay. So let's take a look very quickly at an example where we have a lot of data. Uh, and, I, and here's the formula for counting, but you know how to count. Um, I'm just going to do an example of that, and uh, we'll show you. So, it, it, oh, and I, I want to mention, because uh, it often comes up, and it may come up in the homework. I don't recall if it does. Counting, when you do your capability, for some reason, is called an attribute assessment in the biz, in my biz. So we add some unnecessary language to that. It's just counting. That's an attribute assessment. Okay, let's do the example that's in the book um, on uh, slide uh, uh, 302. And this is just counting. So first of all, let's, uh, uh, I'm going to open up invoices.xls. You can open it up too if you want. Oh, 102, thank you. <laughs> Yes, 102. Thanks, Sue. Sue's always keeping me honest. Well, look, Shani and I were confused for a second, so I figured in respect to our colleagues, <laughs> no, we I was want them to flounder. Well, clearly I was confused. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, these are collections times uh, of an invoice. And just to be analytic about this, <clears throat> 
analytic about this. Uh, I'm going to draw my box and I'm going to say collection times it's a KOV on invoices, right? So this would be maybe an accounts receivable or something like that. Uh, and this is a number that we see there. So one num analysis would be appropriate, right? Now we're not talking about baseline. We we should be watching. Uh, we should be looking at the control chart as well. But this is just calculating the capability. So let's go through that. Let me just be do the most obvious thing. And the most obvious thing would be to look at this and compare every number to uh, what our spec was. So the first thing is what is our spec that we have? It says 20 days. So we don't want our aging and our collect and our receivables to be greater than 20 days. Good luck to you, by the way. But um, uh, 20 days is our specification. That might have come from a, a, a manager or it might be coming from somewhere else. So one of the things that we could do, and I'll make this as big as possible so you can see it, is put an if-then statement in. So uh, this isn't a teaching Excel, but this is just I'm comparing this to the number 20, and if it's greater than 20, I'm going to count it as a 1, otherwise I'm going to put a 0 in there. So if I copy that all down, I can get to the bottom of it. And if I go to the bottom, I can see how many, oh my gosh, I've got 10,000 numbers. I should have done that first, right? 10,000 numbers, that's a lot of data. <laughs> so I, I, I'm comfortable with counting here. So let me just count. Uh, and now I'm just going to sum up the ones. If I sum up the ones, I've got 2,594. And I remember I said I had 10,000. And so I can look at that one divided by the other. And so my capability is, is I'm going to put this in percent, about 26% or 2594 percent. Okay? So um, not a very good process uh, compared to it, whether it's stable or not. All right. And perhaps an easier way to do it or a more direct way would be to simply go into Excel statistics. And I'm going to do this now as well uh, to show you that it can be done here. This is going to slow down your computer a lot. This is the dark side of Excel statistics. Excel statistics works great when you have small data sets. When it's large, it starts to get a little bogged down. So Make sure that you shut down displays when you're done with large uh, displays. Okay, and we'll go to our second tab, which shows the histogram. But you'll note there we get some quick uh, statistics on it. So there's our 10,000, which is nice. Let me go to the summaries. And again, I'm going to blow up this particular thing so we can see it a little bit better. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it goes from 0 to 120. And my spec was 20, right? All right, so maybe I can just change the number here from 10 to 12. And lo and behold, there's my 20 and everything above 20. Not quite sure what I did 29. It's kind of interesting. Let me just type in 120. There we go. Okay, it was probably rounding in this box. I'm going to go to percentage, and I'm going to show my values. And... Now I'm going to, if I divide this by 2, if I go to 6 instead of 12, I can collapse this, these two below 20. And that might make it easier for me to read. And in fact, it does 74.06. If I take 100% minus that, I get 25.94. Gee, that sounds similar to what I got before. If I want to go the whole distance, that's a little bit difficult um, to get it just into 2. But I certainly can do it. Um, I could go from, say, 20 to 120 and just do one class, and that will show me that there's 25.94% uh, percent of the data. Okay? But uh, I think the, the way that we did it the first time, going from 0 to 120, is probably a clearer way to show it if you're showing people what percent is below. And then you can talk through, well, that means the percent above is 20 is 100% minus 74. I think that works. Okay, so I showed you two different ways to count. All we're really doing is counting. Whichever way is your preferred method. I like making a picture, so I prefer that method. We're good. Okay, so that's counting. 
All right. And here's in the book. This is uh, with Minitab. Uh, this is the picture that you get as well. Okay. Now we're going to go into another case, and this case is when we don't have a lot of data. So we can, I think, pretty easily agree that when we have 10,000 data points, that's a lot of data. But what happens when we have less than that? I have 50, or I have 100. So the first thing I want to do is define this in a little way. So uh, 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 let's define the data when we don't have a lot of data as we can say, um, and you can just put this in here, uh, we can say uh, if, do the thought experiment, if we collected another 25%, are we confident we get the same results? or we get the same picture. That's the question I want you to ask. Okay? So if we collected another 25%, so if we collected 100 data points, if we collected another, 20, another 25, do you think that would change our, our thoughts on what this would look like, or do you think it wouldn't? Like with the 10,000, if we collected another 25, drop in the bucket, right? It's not going to change our picture much. But if we collected 100, yeah, maybe we do need to collect a little bit more. Now, part of this depends on the process. If I'm talking about, uh, um, if I'm talking about really, uh, if I'm talking about normal distributions, that is data that look kind of like this, I might not, if I collect a lot more, get much of a different uh, picture. But if I'm talking about something that looks kind of like really choppy, if I do my histogram it looks really choppy, if I calculate it, if I, if I collected another 25 or 30 data points, it might ease out some of those chops, or it might give me some outliers over here, extend it. I'm not sure what's going to happen. So it kind of falls into that category. Okay? Let's do an example, and I think that this will, will help us talk it through. To answer this definitively, we'll need to look into, uh, into sample size, which we're not ready to do yet. Okay, um, we, we're not equipped with the tools yet. Okay, so um, the first thing is I want to talk just very briefly about the bell curve. Um, uh, we've all seen this bell curve before, um, but bell curve has some nice properties, and a couple of properties of the bell curve, first of all, many processes fall into this, uh, but one of the nice properties is that 68% of the data, we know this, that 68% of the data fall in between the mean, uh, plus or minus one standard deviation. And in fact, control chart limits, when we have the plus or minus three standard deviations in control charts, are done based on normal theory, uh, because we find out that plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean uh, is, it covers about 99.7% of the data. So almost all the data, or three chances out of a thousand. So control chart limits are given at three sigma um, to be certain that if we go above them, it's a pretty rare event. It's a pretty rare event. All right, so let's do an example uh, here, and let's just cut to the chase. Okay, just to mention in the book, uh, there is the old way, doing normal curves and Z values. We're not going to do that. If you want to talk to me about it, I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk that through. We're going to do an example in Excel stats, and then I'll show you how to do it in Minitab, and then we'll call it a day. Okay. The example that we're going to work through, and, and by the way, in some of the notes, there's, there's some of them. The example that we're going to work through is called emails.xls, and let's just do it uh, uh, on the board. We'll note that this is data that I've collected um, where this was years ago. I counted the number of emails I got daily, and... Um, I, I kind of figured that there was, a, let me define what a bad email day was. If I got 40 or more emails, I was spending more time on emails than I was getting work done, and uh, vice versa. Okay? So a 40 was kind of my spec. So I want to calculate, uh, I want to see if I can count, you know, if I look at the histogram, and I'm going to draw my line at 40, 
uh, maybe my histogram, what I care about is this is percent that. Okay? That's, 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 the, uh, that's the context. That would be my capability. So that's the idea. I want to calculate capability when I have this. Let's look into that one. So to do that, I'm going to open up the file emails. I'm going to close this one because it's bogging me down. Cell stats goes laboriously slow when you have a lot of data open. And the fact it's even crashing my Excel right now. I'm going to pray that it does not ca crash my uh, go to meeting. Okay. That was me doing a little prayer. Okay, so here's my emails. And uh, again, we'll note, I'm going to try and practice what I preach here. We'll note that uh, here I've got number of emails received daily. And that's a number, so I'm going to do a one num. Okay, not one wum, one num. So let's do that. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to notice is that A, it looks kind of normal shape, doesn't it? And B, I've got 60 data points. So maybe I'd want to calculate, maybe I'd want to collect more data. Okay, so certainly a lot less than than um, than uh, than ten thousand. Uh, so if I went here and I directly did what I did before, I went from say zero to well, sixty is pretty good. Oops, I'm sorry, zero to sixty, and maybe I did. Um, let's just look at a few boxes here. Let's look at uh, six. Now let's look at eighteen boxes. Um, so you can see it's kind of spread out there, and 40 was my limit. I don't know. I'm not sure I'd be so confident that if I got another 20 data points or so, that I wouldn't get a slightly different count. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm going to do is effectively, what I'm going to do is I'm going to effectively draw a smooth curve here, and I'm going to draw my line here, and I'm going to let the computer kind of calculate this percentage for me. Instead of just counting, I'm going to let the computer do it, and I'm going to uh, estimate this with a model that's called the normal distribution. Okay? So that's the idea. All right, we'll do this uh, in Excel Stats. We'll do it in Minitab. We'll do one more example, and we'll call it a... I'm going to do this fairly quickly. Uh, so how do you do that in Excel stats? It's actually quite straightforward. For a normal distribution, what we're going to do is we're going to notice that we're going to write down the mean and the standard deviation. In this case, the mean you should see is 24.9, and the standard deviation is 9.66. Okay, you see that? We need those values. Once I've done that, I'm going to go to, remember I said PDF was the tool of choice? I'm going to go to PDF for pretty darn fine. I'm going to go to Normal, and I'm going to just blow this up just a little bit. You don't have to do that, but I find it makes it easier to read. And I'm going to enter in some things. Okay. Remember I said I was going to try and get that area. Now I have to enter in the area, but I need to put in my, my specifics for my normal fit, which was 24.9 mean and a standard deviation of 9.66, right? Okay, so this is a normal distribution with a mean of 24.5 and a standard deviation of 9.66. This is what it looks like. Okay, notice that it's, that it's centered on about 24.66. Or, I'm sorry, 24.9 or 25 among friends, I guess. All right, now I put my spec in right here, and I said it was 40, correct? If I put 40 there, and I'm going to shade the cumulative probability right there, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the area above the purple. That's my bad, okay? And so that's the picture of it. 
ah, if I come over to here, it's given right by that. So there's my probability that little x is above 40 is 6%. You see that? 6%. Probability that I'm below it is 94%. Probability that I'm above it, 6%. So that forms the basis for my estimate, and that's a heck of, I'm a heck of a lot more comfortable with that than I am with just counting uh, in uh, my one num analysis, which was right here. I could certainly go to here and count, uh, but uh, and in fact, it may even be close to 6%. But now what I've effectively done is I've effectively drawn that fit, and I've said that this percentage right here is about equal to 6%. Now, would I take, if I had 10,000 uh, 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 measurements, uh, would I take that? and Would it, that be a better estimate than the 6%? You bet it would be. But when I only have 60, I'm much more comfortable with fitting that normal distribution and then making that happen. Okay? All right. Um, so that's it. I mean, that, that's basically how you do it. I'm going to give one more example in, uh, in Excel stats, and this is the one that's uh, from slide. We're doing the very, uh, we're actually doing the, uh, we're going to do the exercise on slide 125. So we're jumping ahead quite a bit. Exercise on slide 125 which is a slightly different uh, case. We're looking at, uh, suppose we're in an HR department and a Six Sigma team wanted to reduce the number of days it took to find a qualified candidate for certain types of jobs, maybe a managerial type of job or an engineering type of job or an analyst type of job or a nursing uh, nurse, uh, uh, maybe a, a registered nurse or a head nurse. Um, uh, okay, so the upper spec is 60 days. So we don't want to take longer than 60 days. Um, there, and it says there is no lower spec. So let's open up the, the data here and let's figure out if we can figure out the capability. Find if we can, how to, how to do the capability for this. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to shut down the one that we just did. And we shut down the emails one so they don't get confused. I get confused about what data are open enough. So this is it. This is our this is our email. This is how long it takes to identify a candidate. Whoa. Okay. So let's go back to here. So here I've got um, my process is identify time. I'm calling that. That's my name of my variable. Maybe I could have come up with a better name, but. That's it, and that looks like a number. So again, I'm going to do one num analysis uh, on this, and particularly I'm going to calculate a baseline in this section. So let's go ahead and do that. Should be getting old hat at this now. All right, so the first question is, wow, that looks like a funky histogram. Um, remember, um, in the lecture on Tuesday, we talked about how to how to look at a histogram or what are some of the tricks. Uh, you want to open it up a little bit on the, hand, on the end, so give yourself a little bit of room. Excel Stats and Minitab both go from the min to the max, so I like to open that up a little bit. Instead of going from 24, maybe go from, say, 20. But instead of 59, maybe let's give, make it to 65 or something like that. Maybe even 15 to 65 would be good. Um, and then you want to play around a little bit with the number of classes. Um, um, 10 is probably pushing it for this data, but um, you know, if we went to 20, I'll show you it's kind of a ridiculous thing to do. I'm going to get a bunch of spikes. Um, yeah, not the greatest, but um, if I go back to 10, maybe I'm good. You'll notice that I looked up here and I said I had 20, uh, uh, 20 different uh, buckets or 20 different data points. So um, certainly I don't have a lot of data. All right, now here's a good example of where counting would get you into serious trouble because let's just go ahead and do the count to see what we would get. So in this case, uh, the specification was 60, right? So let's go from, I don't know, 0 to 120. And let's just put two classes. And I want to do percentage 
and show the values. Well, okay, so we just counted, and we this is basic. This is saying, hey, this is a process that's 100% good. Well, I don't know about you, but I would feel very, very uncomfortable if I were going to go up to anybody and say, we're never going to make a mistake when I see data that shows this. There's some times I'm pretty close to that 60. So maybe a, a, a better way of doing this would be, um, would be to, uh, uh, what did I say, 15 to 65. Yeah, that's, that's what I... 65, there we go, uh, would be a better way of doing this maybe would be to fit a distribution. And right now, normal is the only one that we have in our arsenal, but it's not too bad. It's not too bad of a fit and uh, to calculate the area under the curve. It's not going to be zero. It's not going to be very big either. But let's, let's see what that is. Um, so to do that, let's do it in Excel stats first, and then we'll do it very quickly in Minitab. I'll show you it's... It's simpler, but it involves a plot that may be a little bit scary. So this one, I'm just going to write down the mean. The mean is 40.6 among friends and 10.6 uh, standard deviation. And we'll go to, remember it's PDF, and we'll do the normal. Um, and uh, again, let's type in, in this case, we had a 40.6 mean and a 10.6, 10.6 standard deviation. The value of the variable that we care about here is 60. And uh, let's just shade the cumulative probability. There it is right there. Very interesting. It certainly is non-zero, but it's not very big either. There it is, 3%, it says. So in this case, we predict our defect rate would be three percent. Okay? So, um, you know, so to come back here, our estimate of the process capability for this would be either, uh, uh, it's either three percent defect rate or ninety-seven percent uh, good. Okay? Uh, either of those is a good estimate for these two. All right, and I think it was 3.3% if you want it to be more precise. But, but you know, 3%, when we only have 20 data points, I can tell you, uh, if you're giving it to a single percentage digit, that, that's a pretty good estimate. But it's certainly that's a far cry from saying it's zero and it's never going to produce a bad result. Now, um, to show you in, 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 um, in the book, we use a technique called uh, a uh, probability plot in Minitab, and here's what it looks like. Um, I'm going to show you how to do that in Minitab. You can go through the book and see it. Uh, uh, Tracy, for you, this is definitely a black belt technique. So uh, just to let you know, uh, I don't think that we're giving you any short shrift on this. Uh, if we open up in Minitab, I'll show you. It's actually pretty straightforward to do. We want to, first of all, get the data into Minitab like we always do. We're going to do a lot of Minitab starting next week. So, um, uh, uh, so it's going to be much more of a mixture of Excel stats and Minitab. We actually, again, do it straight from a graph, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to graph identify time. And uh, if we do this, there's a probability plot is... Um, is this. Now this looks crazy, but what really is going on here is that each one of these, like this point right here, you'll see 30 lines up with this 20%. So what does that mean? That means that only 20% of the time do we find a candidate within 30 days. See that? And then this 40 lines up with uh, the Excel statistics picture of uh, where this is 40% then. And, uh, oops, I'm sorry. 50, it's this 50%. I screwed up. 50%. So this would say that 40, that our spec for the, the percentage of time that we're below 40 is about 50% of the time. And this would say right here, going up to here and across, uh, if I can draw a straight line, that shows me that it's about 
96, you know, obviously this is just eyeball, about 96% of the time we're below 60. That's, that's how to read this plot. That's a 96%. That's how to read it. Now, luckily, you don't have to have a stupid little pen like I do and draw it. Minitab can draw it for you. So I'm going to redo this using Minitab again. That's graph, probability plot, and do this again. And it turns out that in, I believe it's in scale, we'll have occasion to do this again, percentile lines. We can type in, I want to see a percentile at the data value of 60. Click OK, click OK. And Minitab gives you, there it is right there, it says, the, date, the amount of percentage less than 60 is 96.6. I only drew that to show you what was being shown on here. So at 96.6, if I invert that, that's about 3.4%. That's what we got doing the other. It does give you the same answer, which is good. Math still works in Minitab and Excel stats. Um, but uh, maybe uh, you might find this a little bit easier. The one thing that I would say, because you didn't have to calculate the mean, you see, you just went ahead and did it. In Excel stats, you have to cal you have to do the one num first and translate over the mean. Um, what I can tell you is that if you put this picture up in a management meeting, you're going to have, as as Ricky used to say, you're going to have a lot of explaining to do. So um, you know, it's 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 not something that's easily explained right away. Uh, one thing I will tell you is that the fact that we're inside of all these lines right here, see that center line and then there's these two lines over there, that tells me that the normal approximation ain't bad. Um, and pretty soon it's going to tell you that too. All right. So anyway, that's how to do it in Minitab. And I just wanted to show you that quickly and uh, to, to kind of finish this up. Um, so that's it. There's, there's one other, um, there's one other uh, exercise in here where we do a two-sided specification and uh, you can walk through in that but I, I want to make sure that we that we really understood how to do a one-sided spec and that uh, and that you understood how to do it in Excel statistics because it's a nice picture and uh, really important so now you know now you know how to fit a distribution and get the area under the curve um, that, that's something that it took Isaac Newton his whole lifetime to do and now you know how to do it and we did it in an hour um, and Newton was a pretty smart guy um, so, um, so that's it. Um, anyway, uh, I, I'll be around after the uh, after the lecture for plenty of uh, for plenty of questions if you have uh, if you have them. Um, but uh, for now, uh, let's just take a moment to uh, to. I'm having trouble. I'm having trouble. Um, there we go. I'm having trouble getting back to where I was. My chalkboard. I like my chalkboard. Um, so let's just take a moment to summarize. Uh, today we covered uh, baselining, which consists of two points, the voice of the process and the voice of the customer. Voice of the process is stability, and you use a control chart. So look at that. Okay. The voice of the customer is capability, and effectively you use a histogram, or a, now you know you use a fitted line, and you look at the percent bad, or if you're glass half empty person, you look at the percent good. Okay, that's what capability is. And then we looked in more detail on capability, and we found that when we have lots of data, We count how many are in, how many are out, and that's good. We can get a percentage. When we have little data, we uh, estimate by drawing the curve. And in Excel stats, we use PDF. In Minitab, we use a probability plot. And that's Minitab. And this is Excel stat. Okay. And that's about it, uh, folks, for today. Remember uh, to turn in your, if you haven't yet turned in assignment number two, remember to turn that in. 
a couple of people who still haven't done that. And um, last thing I want to say is, you know, I sent you the assignment. Remember, you're, a, you're assigned partners. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call me at 607-227-8719. And uh, have a great, fantastic, either rest of the day off uh, or weekend or both. Okay? So I'm going to stop the recording now, and I'll field any questions you have. Um, uh, and I'll talk to you. Uh, talk to you later.